Hello, everyone. Welcome to Untold Stories in Tech Hiring, the webinar by OfferZen. My name is Anthea and I head up engagement at OfferZen and I'll be your host this evening. Welcome to the conversation. I'm really excited uh, for our topic this evening and our chat with Nadia Vatalidis, uh, who is the VP of People at Remote. Um, we're kicking off in a few minutes, so feel free to grab yourself something to drink or to settle in um, as we wait uh, for more people to join um, in a minute or two. For those of you that are on the call already, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, um, just your name and what company you are, you're at and where you're dialing in from. Wow, hello, uh, Cliver uh, from Miami, Florida. Other side of the world, love that. Gabriella from Soup Adventures in Bristol in the UK. Welcome, Berlin, Italy. Yaku from Job Jack in Cape Town, which is also where I'm dialing from. Well, a uh, really great representation. Greece, Rwanda, Canada, Germany, fantastic. Awesome, so nice to see everyone represented, fantastic. Well, we're about two minutes in, so I think we'll kick off. Um, for those of you that just joined, hi, welcome. My name is Anthea. I head up engagement at OfferZen, and I'll be your host this evening for the conversation with Nadia Vatanidis, the VP of People um, at Remote. I'm very excited for the conversation. If this is your first time joining an Untold Stories webinar, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that we run monthly webinars for the tech hiring community uh, to help them get better at hiring developers. The bad news is that this is our final one for the year. Um, our next one uh, will be in February 10, 2023. So keep an eye out uh, for that. And we look forward to seeing you then. And of course, if you have just joined, um, please introduce yourself in the chat. Just drop your name um, and your company and where you're dialing in from. A little bit about us. Uh, OfferZen is a tech talent marketplace that was first founded in Cape Town in 2016. We were founded and are run by devs, working to connect developers to awesome job opportunities. In 2020, we expanded into what we call Middle Earth, which is the GMT plus two time zone, and that spans most of Africa and right into Europe. The Office and Platform connects curated, actively seeking uh, developers from an engaged developer community with exciting job opportunities at over 2,000 companies in Africa and in Europe. We are also very much a community-focused platform, which is why we run events like our Untold Stories in Tech Hiring series um, and webinars. Ultimately, we want to connect the community, i.e. you, to people who have shared experiences and interesting stories to tell. We get the devs and can help you hire them. And so if you are interested about finding out more, um, you can hit I'm interested in the poll on your screen. And someone from our team will set up a chat about how we can accelerate your developer hiring. Cool. Um, on that note, let's jump in. Uh, before we start, here are some housekeeping rules to help things run smoothly this evening. Most of us have been joining webinars for the last two years and a bit, so this should be straightforward. Uh, first of all, uh, remember you can see us, but we can't see you. If you do drop off the call, you can come back at any time using the same link that you received in your inbox. If you have any questions, we have a questions tab on the right of your screen. Um, you're most welcome to pop your questions in there throughout the evening. And um, we'll also be taking those questions um, as the conversation goes. And we'll also, if we have time, uh, do a wrap up of final questions at the end of the webinar. Um, finally, you have the chat tab, um, which is the one you've been using to introduce yourself. Um, and if you've just joined, please take a moment to share your name, company, and where you're dialing in from. To start the night off, though, um, night where I am in Cape Town, and to get to know all of you from wherever you are, we're going to run a quick icebreaker poll to see the topic appetite for this evening. Um, and the question, which should be on your screen soon, um, is what is your favorite thing about remote working? 
Um, and while you click through to that, I was chatting with uh, Nadia just before the call. I am basically a digital nomad at the moment. So being able to work remote means I can travel a lot more, um, see a lot more of the world. And that always makes me quite happy. So if you can add your voice in there, that will be great. Um, and then we can see what the outcome of those uh, of that poll is. Let me just click it there and have a look. Right, so at the moment, we're leading with flexibility. I've heard that a lot, especially people with uh, little kids or who have other commitments. Better work-life balance, definitely um, high as a top priority for us coming out of the pandemic in the last two years. Interesting that we have 9% for other reasons, also 9% for commute, commute time, and then 11% for higher productivity. So I think this is quite an interesting poll. Thank you for adding your voice if you haven't yet it should be still on your screen feel free to go and um, drop your vote in there and then before i welcome my speaker uh welcome to everyone from all across the world it's really great to have you at this final untold stories or the last one for the year untold stories in tech hiring um, and on that note let me invite my speaker nadia Vatalidis onto the stage nadia Hey, Anthea. Hey, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, I love seeing the chat and all those amazing locations. Very, very distributed audience tonight. Very fitting for the topic as well. I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah. Nadia, it's really lovely to have you. Um, I've enjoyed uh, all the, the run up to this evening, all the conversations we've had. Um, I've uh, really enjoyed learning from you um, on the topic from this evening. But before we jump in, do you want to take a quick moment and tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Nadia Vatalidis, uh, VP of People at Remote. Uh, Remote is a company that basically allows the accessibility of onboarding, paying, and doing all the very complicated compliance things in more than 65 countries in the world. So ideal for global hiring, where you have these amazing people that you want to work with and figuring out how to, how to onboard and hire them. Um, I've been at Remote for two years. It's been an incredible journey so far. December will be my second anniversary. And we scaled uh, Remote from... Roughly 70 people when I joined, um, and we're currently 950 people in more than 75 locations in the world. So it's very distributed um, and really proud of the accessibility we're creating in, in the world of work. What an intense scale up in the last two years. I cannot wait to unpack that a bit more. <laughs> um, what I do want to start off with is during our initial conversation for uh, the webinar, you mentioned that from a people planning perspective, remote as a business is currently in a sustaining period. Could you unpack for our audience what exactly that means for remote right now? Absolutely. I think the world of tech um, is definitely going through a very interesting economic crisis, name it what you like. Um, it's a very, it's, it's a change in pace. I think the pandemic was um, a unicorn phase for many, many companies in the world and especially for the tech space. It definitely unblocked the opportunity to do, to have new segments and new markets and new sales and locations that a lot of companies might have not even considered or thought about previously. But I think we're now in a, in a phase that is more telling of where the world is at after the pandemic, right? And I know the pandemic still exists. I had COVID a little while back. So if I'm coughing tonight, I'm really sorry. I'm trying to, to get rid of it. Um, but I, uh, I must say, um, I think it's just telling to see what has happened post-pandemic in the world of work. Um, sustain sustainability is actually super important, even if you're just starting out. And I think a lot of companies and tech companies in particular started Series A and get sort of dollar signs, you know, once they, they hit those big Series A checks or even unicorn status in Series C, some, some achieves it, some doesn't. Um, but it does go into that big spend phase. Um, and I think a lot of companies can learn from sustainability early on. That doesn't mean you don't hire. It doesn't mean that you don't have any money to spend or you have no budget. It means going into it with a very sustainable mindset, just like we treat sustainability in the world of environment um, you can do that in a company as well um, and so I think I think it's underrated in the world of work um, and especially in globally distributed teams um, and although it doesn't often sit with the people team it sits with the finance team usually controlling that it is a responsibility of every person uh, working at a tech startup that is still 
you know, underfunding. Um, if you're not profitable yet, you certainly should be sustainable, in my opinion. Love yeah. that. I, I think the, the interesting part there is probably collaborating with finance on this so that the planning aligns quite well. Um, so it's with finance and obviously also with the people team. So what are the hardships your team or the, the um, people ops team um, makes during a sustaining period versus a scaling period? Great question. I think it's about really reassessing what tools you have. So, um, and those tools can also be vendors, right? Suppliers, people that you're working with um, and really optimizing that. I really look at very efficient ways of integrating, automating systems and platforms. But when it comes to hiring, you've got to make a decision whether you're going to lean into getting a vendor like an office in or something similar to really support you during that phase versus keep scaling a recruiting or sourcing, et cetera, team and thinking ahead, whether in the next two to five, let's say two years, I think that's usually a good period in a startup. You can't think too far ahead, right? Can you sustain that team that you're going to hire or can you sustain the costs that's associated with using an expert provider in the space that you're hiring? And in tech, we all know engineers are very difficult to find. And so if you're not good at that, it's probably good to start thinking about a good collaborator or good partner to see you through those times. Um, but optimizing, building efficiencies. I, lo I love the, 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 um, the thought process of from taking three hours a day to do something, whether that is screening CVs or whether that is onboarding an employee, how do I reduce that? What are the methods I'm going to use? What are the tools I'm going to use to reduce that and become way more efficient in my role? Um, and rolling that up and down in the organization so that efficiency sort of leans and, and starts belonging with sustainability and building through this more challenging phase um, in the tech space or in your, in your organization. I love that. I think the interesting thing there is that oftentimes, you know, the future is quite unpredictable and you don't know what, what it holds, but you can definitely align um, your people planning with finance and with how you are growing as a business. So beyond sort of, you know, taking that kind of two year period into account, uh, working with finance, what are the other kinds of things that's important to take into account when you are planning sustainability in terms of people planning? Um, headcount is your most expensive cost, right? And so if you're not doing a headcount plan today, if you don't have a hiring plan, and if you don't have a way to, I'm not talking about a 50-step approval process, right? We're not a corporate. We never want to be a corporate. Mm -hmm. I'm really talking about a way to go and approve whether a position should be hired for and whether that is critical skills and competencies the organization requires or not. Um, we often always fall into the trap to to throw more people at a problem. And I think sometimes it's important that you figure out if I hire this very critical, competent individual, will they be able to bring me what maybe less skilled individuals can bring me um, two or three people? And so it's better to then invest in that engineer or invest mm -hmm. in that highly critical, talented individual. And so I think it's really about headcount planning. Um, I love connecting budgets to headcount. And so I nearly think your headcount plan should be based off your budget. Um, a lot of companies also pre-Series C, so let's use Series A, don't necessarily have budgets. And I think like in the world of, of startup and tech, starting frugal and having a, like a borderline basic budget is a really good thing. Um, again, it's not to control you to a point where you can't make decisions or where you can't scale quickly or you can't make mistakes and startups, you've got to be fearless in terms of making mistakes. But I think connecting it to a budget is important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and figuring out how that how that's going to align with the business needs, um, especially around talent. Love that. Um, we have a pertinent question here from Lee Watts, uh, very interesting in relation to the headcount um, planning. Um, Lee wants to know, how do you manage the desire for department heads wanting to hire, so just increase headcount, versus finances control um, overspend, almost a clash of titans when considering sustainability. I think it's about the calculation you're doing to decide on headcount. I believe that you, you've got to use some analysis on how you're making a decision about headcount. Because if it's simply saying, we don't have enough people, then I, I'm always there to challenge you and saying, what is it where you require more people? And so a really quick example, 
Um, Anthea, I've shared this with you before. You know, when I joined remote, I knew my people team is not going to be substantial. I knew that frugality is going to matter at some point, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, and although at that point we had ample cash and we had, you know, investors just wanting to throw money at us, I knew it's going to change because I've done the startup world before and I understand how this journey works, especially if you want to IPO in future, if you want to become profitable, depending on your, on your North Star. And so, you know, I joined and I looked at our onboarding process and we were roughly spending between three and five hours per new hire, um, you know, every single day to, to get them onboarded. And if we were, if, if I had one person doing onboarding or two p people doing onboarding and I needed to scale to 950 people, that simply isn't scalable spending three to five hours a day. And so that calculation was very simple to me. I could throw 20 people to it, but I don't think that would have solved any of our problems. We would have still been really slow. And so instead, I really leaned into efficiency. I started looking at what ATS are we using? What applicant tracking system are we using? How does that integrate with where I store my employment data? I use remote the platform, so very lucky in that regard. Um, and so building those strategic relationships with your tech ops team, with your engineering team to start figuring out, can I build an integration? How would that work? How much time will it save? And eventually within a month or two, we knocked um, our entire onboarding timeline down from three to five hours down to 30 minutes per person. And that scaled beautifully, right? Mm. But that level of efficiency really took me to not throw 20 people at the problem. Mm. And it would have been very easy for any director to say, oh, we need more people to onboard. Like, let's just mm. hire. Mm. I don't think that solves problems. I think mm. in the world of tech, you've got to, you've got to be efficient. You've got to be effective um, in your role. 100%. I think it also uh, speaks to, there's a, a book called Multipliers, which is kind of how can you look at the current capacity that you have, get more out of your people, and then from a systems perspective, look at where you're currently investing time and effort that you can probably streamline much better. Love that. Um, I do Absolutely. have another question, a follow-up one from uh, Julia um, Nunez-Silva. How to balance focusing on increasing efficiency while still doing business as usual. So do you work with external support here or would you rather recommend increasing your people team? So find how do you find those efficiencies within your own team and kind of prioritize that for um, addressing? I like building a core um, people function and a core structure. So having you know, the right experts on my team. I'm not a total rewards expert. I hired a total rewards expert. You know, I'm not an, a, a labor law or... Um, employee relations expert. So slowly starting to build a team or someone for that. And so if you think about all the core critical areas of people and um, building that foundation and then saying, right, scaling beyond this is going to become very large very quickly. So can I use a vendor to go and source engineers for me instead of going through 80,000 applications? Probably, right? And I learned this the hard way, Anthea, last year, October, we, um, we had this like very interesting argument with LinkedIn at the time. And we were saying remote, you know, should be a location and please update your product to have remote only as a location. I don't want to add a location to my job adverts. And they were explaining infrastructure wise, they simply can't do it. It's mapped to a geographies, right? And remote is simply not a geography in the infrastructure. And it's very difficult to change that. And so their advice was to just, you know, wrap all our positions to locations. And we did it. And we ended up getting 80,000 applications in Q4 last year. And it was devastating. I would love to say to 80,000 people to come and work at remote, but the talent I lost, the time, the efficiency we lost during that time was ridiculous. The hardship we went through to filter, to figure it out, the amount of engineers we probably never spoke to, the amount of incredible individuals around the world we never spoke to is very real, right? And it also felt... Um, it also felt awful to decline that amount of people really quickly because ultimately we need to get to the bottom line. We need to hire people to join us. And so I think there was this key opportunity to say, right, I need engineers. I need Alexa engineers. I'm going to part some of offers in. I need, you know, these other skilled non-engineering talent. Who is the best that's going to support me? Who is going to be worth going the extra mile to work with my timelines, my budget, um, and where I'm at in my journey and really partnering with those. There are times where partnerships simply works 
And um, again, that goes from the integration tool stack right through the vendors that you create to build those um, to build those core partnerships with to get mm-hmm. through those times. And so, just a a good example of of, of yeah. what what could have been um, mm-hmm. in that instance, and way more efficient and effective. I love that because it's also grounded in the reality of the business, looking ahead, what are you going to need, assessing the right kinds of partners that can probably integrate for the long run. Um, those are all um, key components to making you know the efficiency savings work. Um, you mentioned the 80,000 applications, and I think it's a great segue into what's currently happening within the tech world. Um, so lots of layoffs we're seeing from big tech, lots of hiring freezes. I think from a, the perspective of remote being in a you know sustaining phase, I would imagine that right now being in this position is not a bad position to be in. Would you agree with that? Um, I agree. I think it's a great time to start figuring it figuring out what is it we really want and how and what is that journey and it's also that great opportunity to have that critical skills conversation we don't hire for degrees and qualifications and experience we hire for competencies and skills and a lot of companies in the world of tech and modern organizations that really care about the human factor is leaning into competency and skills based hiring I still see very big corporate companies hiring for degrees and experience over skills and competencies, right? And so I think it is a really good position to be in, to reflect, uh, to do a bit of a retrospective of what we don't want to do again, um, and to make really good decisions um, moving forward. Um, I think I think what I will also add, I think during more sustainable periods is really where you are going to build the better and probably the best future where everyone can benefit. So most tech startups offer stock options, right? And so if I eventually can turn remote into a profitable company that can potentially IPO, I know that everyone with vested stock is going to benefit, not just me. And so that that nearly becomes like a shared opportunity to share the, econ- the economy and the success of an organization like this. Mm-hmm. Similar to what I experienced at GitLab. You know, when I joined GitLab, Anthea, it was this um, tiny tech startup 2015, 2016, sorry, excuse me, and many people um, were wondering how I was going to get paid, including my family. I think my parents were like, are you going to need to rely on us again? I know you're married, but what are we going to do if you don't get paid? How are they going to pay your salary? Um, And is you met these people on the internet? Like, who are they? Where are they from? How do you know... How do you know? All you valid concerns. All valid concerns. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think going through that four-year journey with them, and then watching GitLab in Nasdaq going through IPO, was a complete real picture of what tech companies do in the world of work, and how quickly they did it was incredible to watch and experience. Right, and that is very, very much based on a very sustainable plan. Frugality was something GitLab truly believed in. I've always kept that with me as I continue to grow in my career. Um, And that sustainability and saving money and and not overspending, I think it's a very good habit even in a personal life to have. Um, And so, yeah, it excites me about the future. Uh, It gives everyone an opportunity to stop and really reflect and then make really good decisions moving forward. Yeah, I love that answer. I think it's also so reflecting, very important. We definitely don't have enough time. We don't even give ourselves enough time to reflect. Um, setting up the, you know, better for the future, frugality and good money um, principles, all 100%. Um, I want to pivot slightly now to just looking a little bit at um, how you work with your global team. Um, so as remote being a global company and also a largely remote company, you've really taken advantage of tapping into global talent pools. So whether it's, you know, all the applications that you get by LinkedIn, when you guys set that up um, to where you are now scaling um, multiples uh, from two years ago, what's essential when people teams are trying to assess remote talent pools, specifically remote tech talent pools? Amazing question. I think it's really what your culture is built on. Um, At remote, our culture is truly built on values, right? We need to assess if someone can align to those values. And we, now that we're in this stage of the journey, we have built amazing competencies per team. And so that combination between, does the person have the competencies to work in my team? And do they align with remote's values? 
and I, I call it star-based questions, right? Remote still uses a lot of the star-based questions we used very early on in our journey to assess for values alignment. And <clears throat> in the hiring panel, we simply cannot see each other's feedback. So what's really nice is it's a complete unbiased approach. We also funnel all our, all our applications, including when we partner with a vendor like yourselves, right? All our applications through the same pipelines. That creates a very inclusive approach. I still see companies having applications fly through email. It's simply not okay. L landing in someone's inbox is going to almost always create an opportunity for you to stand out from others. I don't necessarily think that's inclusive when you look at the entire hiring pipeline fund. So really push for inclusivity, push for mm -hmm. everyone who gets the same review, the same um, experience. Um, and then during that, that interview process, whether a vendor supplied them or whether you source them yourselves, really assessing, can they align with these values? Can they work in this organization based on the performance we expect, the competencies, competencies we require in this role or not, um, and making those decisions. I also find in a company like this, there really isn't maybe individuals. Um, if you're selecting a maybe or instead of a yes, I think it's an opportunity to decline someone and really set them free to go and find that career thereafter. I think it's very important that you look at the ratings of your hiring panel, how you selected that hiring panel, why you selected them, and then making decisions um, uh, around hiring based on that. I want to ask one question on that, specifically on sort of, you know, the assessment during the hiring process. When you are scaling aggressively, Part of that ask is getting bums onto seats. And, you know, when you are testing this against, you know, if this is a maybe, it should probably be a no. How do you make sure that you land that um, with your hiring team and also that comfortability that, you know, we'll find the right candidate for, you know, our environment, our values and our culture versus, you know, them having quite hard talks in terms of getting people into roles? You can't drop your bar. You, you simply have to hire quality over quantity. Bums and Seeds is not going to build good products. Um, Bums and Seeds are simply not going to turn customers into, you know, annuity income and long segmented markets and, and high margins. Um, I think it's often a mistake to just try and hire high volume for the sake of hiring and just uh, filling a immediate problem that you have. It's nearly like quick fixing. I think what should happen is if you start realizing that you're falling behind in hiring is iterate and partner, right? Start really figuring out what's not working in our hiring process. Who can I partner with immediately to help me with that? And then figuring out what is it going to cost? Can I afford it? What is the efficiencies I will create and the savings I will make by doing that and moving forward with that iteration as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I would never lower my hiring bar. I would simply, if someone isn't aligned to our values, that's the one reason I would always give a hard no uh, in terms of my, my rating. Um, yeah. But again, it depends on the company's okay. you know, culture and what are they, what are they measuring against um, for their hiring? I think it's also, it speaks to your earlier point of, you know, when you are planning ahead in terms of headcount, if you get the A players and the quality people that really can, you know, onboard well into the company, it sets you up well for being in a sustaining period. Um, you know, you have that confidence that you have the, you know, A team on board. Um, going back to, to the hiring, so scale dramatically from two years ago to where we are now, um, but you came in and you kind of had to take your team along with you on this incredible, incredibly scaling um, journey. Um, talk us through those first set of priorities um, that you came in with for setting up your global ops team um, to especially prepare them for hiring a scale. So what were the first things that, in addition to finding those efficiencies that you felt needed to be addressed? Yeah, I think the first thing I looked at was, what is my hiring team doing? How are they hiring? Where are they hiring? What what platforms are they using? Um, are we using the right applicant um, tracking system? Because changing those is very, very painful along the way. And I have gone through multiple changes, not at remote, um, at my previous employer. And people data and employment data and hiring data is very messy. You don't want to mess with that. So early on, really, if you're stepping in, making sure that you have the right tools available to your team and that your team is following the right type of process. Um, sometimes you've got to make quite harsh decisions really early on and make changes that might feel like it's too early. But if you're going into scaling, if you're going through any form of growth, 
not making them fast enough and wait, waiting until the 90 day plan sort of kicks in is too late. And so at remote, I literally had a nine day plan, right? I was told like in nine days, you need to make changes so that we can move forward. Wow. And so onboard fast, tell us what's missing, learn and get moving. And it, it worked really, really well. I also over communicated what I was doing. I think we did build integrations really early on through so something small we did in our hiring pipeline was creating some automations in the actual hiring pipeline. So while I'm sitting in a screening call and it's going really well and everything seems to be on track, compensation, values alignment, the questions are checking out, the experiences that, that we require, the skills are there, literally being ready to move someone to the next stage so that email flies off and starts scheduling the next steps. No one should be waiting for your team, right? And so building, really creating a culture of automation, a culture of making sure there's efficiencies from day one worked for us in terms of hiring. I did need to scale my hiring team. And so I did hire um, at that stage, a senior manager of talent acquisition very early on. I wanted to make sure that is an area in the people team that is dedicated, that has an expert to help scale that team. Thankfully, um, Anastasia, that's still at remote, she's now director of talent acquisition, uh, had a very interesting sourcing background. She built a very interesting sourcing team, which, which literally created a top of funnel opportunity for us to also sustain our 50% female um, uh, at remote, right? So we, we currently identify as 51% female at remote. When I joined, that was the same number. And so having that goal of how do I sustain that type of metric after scaling uh, was a real need and, and was something we deeply cared about. And so having someone that's an expert at understanding that, creating those top of funnel opportunities for women in tech, um, diversity in tech, creating you know cultural diversity, hiring in different countries and challenging managers that are always hiring in the Bay Area or the UK or London or whatever the case may be. Of course you can hire there, but not if you're hiring an entire team there in a company that can hire anywhere in the world, right? And so I think it was really about setting the stage. We created um, um, recruiting and hiring training very early. For a company of that size, I think we, uh, we were pretty smart in getting it off the bat and making sure it was solid and then iterating on it. So delivering something small and excellently and then keep building it on, on it as we grew. So things like that. Ma Maria, yeah. just a question on that. So was that the, the selling point that we're going to deliver something MVP and iterate on it? Or how did you get the buy-in for, you know, building such a training program? I, I think if you're going at a speed of, if you're going at a speed of this and you have to hire that amount of people, um, you've nearly got to not ask. You've, you've nearly got to proactively get stuff done. Right. And I always say at a company like this, you can build a learning plan in three days versus three months, just because you only have three days. Right. Mm. So you're going to deliver the most excellent plan you can think of in three days. Um, and going live with it, what it did create was this amazing opportunity where our very own team started contributing it and adding to it. And so the fact that we made it accessible also meant that the company was building it with us. They were contributing mm to the types of biases they were. They were adding to the values documentation. And all of a sudden, our recruiting and hiring training is incredible. It's something I'd love to open source, by the way. So if I could ever share a link, I will. It's not open source today. But it did put all of us into alignment. If you're going to hire 950 people, you're going to have 45 to 100 hiring managers. If they're not on the same page as what you are and what your hiring team is, there's going to be big battles about who to hire and why. And so getting those things done correctly and, and getting them done in an excellent way from the start and then making them better really uh, worked for us. I love iteration in the world of people. I also think it's underrated and underutilized. Um, and so that's really worked for me um, at Remote and, and in GitLab. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. We have another audience question. Uh, so this one is from Natasha Mangwani. This is a bit related to the conversation that we had just uh, a moment ago. Uh, Natasha wants to know, do you have any examples of questions uh, you can ask during the um, interview process uh, to assess whether a candidate is a good cultural fit um, or aligned with your values? Nice one. Okay, so we have the value of transparency. Um, we have the value of ownership. We have um, a value of um, excellence. 
we have a value of ambition, right? And so a great question for someone on ambition and a bit of transparency could be, tell me about a time where you disagreed with a colleague and just stopping there and letting them talk. It's not about how will you handle. It never is. We're not creating a fake example. I want to hear how Anthea disagreed with someone and what happened. That's all I want to hear. And really then letting them tell you and then asking questions from that and figuring out, one, how comfortable they are talking about a real situation with you Mm -hmm. transparently and how ambitious they were to step out of their comfort zone and disagreeing and debating on a topic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, On ownership as well. Tell me about the hardest project you've ever worked on and how did it, you know, how did it end? What happened? Um, I love asking the failure question, but I don't ask failure. I usually ask like, what's the most disappointing thing that's happened for you this year? And just letting them share with me um, and, and hearing their ambition and their sort of fear for not failing. You cannot, you cannot fear failure in a startup. Um, and if you do, I think imposter syndrome kicks in and it becomes just really difficult to be productive. And mm. so really letting them share how they're going to show up um, at the table, the people table, mm. the marketing table, the engineering table. At a startup, you need people that are going to tell you what's wrong with your product. They, they need mm. to be able to tell you um, how they've messed up and work with you on, on figuring it out, right? And so I, I think it's important that you base your questions off, off real examples. There's many other, we've got hundreds. Mm. Um, at GitLab, I think I created an open source doc on it. I wish I can find it quickly to share it, but yeah, it's mostly we'll, we'll try and we can share it off questions. Yeah, good. We can absolutely find that. Um, I love that you've tied that to the value of transparency and then you how you get there is the scenario-based questions, which also encourages a bit of vulnerability and, and a bit of self-reflection. So I think that's that's a great example of how you can ask, you know, uh, culture fit questions. I do want to ask one thing around certainly the intense um, time of scaling at remote. Uh, specifically when it comes to tech hiring, what breaks during periods of aggressive scale? Everything. Absolutely everything. <laughs> you, you, start seeing, you start seeing gaps in your hiring plan. You see under planning. You see over planning. Um, you notice that your compensation potentially isn't aligned anymore because all of a sudden the whole world has gone to global pay and you were on geo pay or local pay, right? And so absolutely everything does break at some point. I think what's important is... Um, the ability to pivot, the ability to evolve with the company. What you've built at 70 people is not going to still work at 950 people. And if you believe it's going to, I promise you it's not. Um, And so during that time, being fearless about changing and evolving things, and not everyone is going to love that. There are people that genuinely don't like companies that are bigger than 70 to 100 people for that reason. They find it painful to go through the amount of change you go through in two years during hyper growth, right? And so I think it's important to really understand your culture will evolve. If you believe it's going to stay the same, I think there's a problem. The culture of the company will evolve over time if you grow by that much. It doesn't mean it's going to, it's going to negatively evolve. There is going to be growth. There's going to be a growth mindset for everyone. There's also a certain maturing that comes with growing in a startup um, because initially it's nearly like playing whack-a-mole and then all of a sudden it reaches a point where you need to be more strategic. You need to nearly take a step back and make really good decisions moving forward and make harder decisions as well about ending specific vendor contracts, assigning new ones, Mm -hmm. partnering with the right folks, potentially partnering with a company, with an employer brand uh, that really works with yours and that aligns more closely. Mm. Um, Yeah, so absolutely everything can break and it does. With engineering hiring in particular, recruiting teams, (laughs) sorry, are simply never fast enough, right? Um, Mm. If you need to build a big engineering team of like 150 people or 200 people, you do need the capacity and accessibility to do that. And if you're not an expert at it, chances Mm. are you're going to be too slow. Um, and so partnering I think there is a really good opportunity Um, I love that Um, I think the the interesting thing there specifically on um, engineering hires um, and when you are doing this at scale there's two interesting challenges the first one is you try and make sure that your processes are efficient and simple and you can move fast in terms of the hiring and then there's the people component of how do you 
make sure that your people can go out and find the right kinds of talent, find the right kinds of skills. And so for me, it's, it's, I think hiring developers is hard, but finding great tech recruiters is even harder. So in terms of (laughs) empowering your team to find specific languages, to find sort of those uh, niche skills, how did you go about um, enabling them in that way? (laughs) Sorry. It's okay. I'm so sorry. It always happens at night. Um, And so weirdly, this aligned to my evening. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Um, I don't cough during the day. It's it's so funny. Half an hour ago, there was no coffee. Uh, I think... um, I think for me, it was really stepping out of uh, my comfort zone entirely. Um, we have Alexa, backend engineers, JavaScript, React, front-end engineers. And um, if you're going to search on places like LinkedIn, it's going to get really difficult really quickly, right? Engineers typically dislike getting an email from everyone on the planet. And so and I don't think it's because they don't want to talk to you. I think they are so overwhelmed by the amount of DMs and emails that they get every day. And they simply just want to get on with building the future or product that they want. I love stepping into places like meetups um, and really being part of the community. Start speaking the language Alexa engineers speak. Understand where do they hang out? Which geographic locations are the biggest communities of those? So if they're in Brazil and Portugal, Um, and places like Peru and Pakistan or India, like start making sure that you find, where do they hang out? Is there a meetup? Is there a um, a hackathon that specifically includes that language? Is there an event that takes, a tech event that takes place in that country, virtually or not, Mm -hmm. and really get your recruiters to become part of those communities has really worked for us. Um, I, you know, I find that, if you ask my recruiters today, where, where's the most Alexa engineers in the world? They'll literally start like telling you on the, on the palm of their hand. And it's because they, they really aligned with the hiring managers, with our VP of engineering, with every manager engineering, with the engineers themselves. They also mm. ask things like, what questions do you ask in your engineering interviews? What is the assessment like? How long does it take? Is it awful? You know, does it take mm. five hours of someone's time? Do they have five mm. hours to spend on this? And so start thinking about designing an experience around that and how you see your recruiters show up in that space. My sourcing team as well, um, we're, we're highly aligned to how people in that space communicate um, and really get think, closer to that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that we've also seen um, <laughs> even at even at Office End. So it's important to be where the community is, to understand and engage with them where they are playing. And that sets you up so much better for when you want to engage um, with them. And definitely from a hiring perspective, I can see the benefit there. We have a few more um, audience questions. Uh, just a reminder to everyone um, in the audience, you can post your questions in the Q&A tab. Um, I have one here from Lee Watts. And Lee wants to know, how do you maintain the narrative of purpose and belonging to remote measure, mission and vision? How do you maintain a narrative of purpose? So I think, how do you make how do you make sure that that remains core to your mission and vision at remote? Ultimately, culture is built on a bunch of core components. And belonging is definitely one of them. But what, you know, what is belonging built on? Um, in my view, belonging is the outcome of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so if you're not an inclusive company and, you know, you simply do not align to DEI, then building a culture of belonging is very, very difficult. And so to me, it nearly starts there. What are those core components that you are building your culture on? If it's values plus belonging, then remember that's going to come with doing, you know, being really good at diversity, equity, inclusion, and not just writing a bunch of things down, but really living it out daily and making space for it and building initiatives around that. Mm. And then there are, <laughs> sorry, there are absolutely other things as well. Um, if you think about the way you pay people, that is going to influence the way your culture works, right? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Nadia was ill last week, she mentioned earlier, so uh, excuses the cough a little bit. Um, sorry about that. 
Yeah, and so I think belonging and trust really comes based on the space that you create. How you use inclusive language in your organization, mm. and you know, are you tracking things like your DEI metrics? Not for compliance purposes, like that's long gone. It's about are you measuring how many leaders at the company um, are women, are minorities in tech, um, are part of you know other significant groups? Um, do you make space for neurodiversity? Do you make space for um, certain disabilities? And what are those disabilities you can accommodate? And what are they not? So that you can be very clear about the accessibility you're creating in your environment. Mm. So I think it's a bunch of things. It's never one or two components, um, in my opinion. Yeah. And then taking that culture and that those values and really operationalizing it throughout your entire employee experience and journey. I love that because it, it makes me think of the quote of you can only improve what you measure. Um, and so when it comes to these sorts of things, it's, it's key to understand what is the what are the things that I'm going to be measuring that will give me the signal whether we're on track or off track. Um, and again, coming back to that idea of it can be iterative over time, but you need to start you know, identifying what those signals are. Great question. I have another one from Regis Iyumba. Any advice on how to reach and partner with IT or tech recruiters um, and get the subcontract with companies? I think that's a really good question. So you're asking how do you become a vendor at a company? Um, I think creativity is probably key yeah? and the way your growth marketing strategy works in terms of how you do your sales outreach. Um, I think DMing a bunch of VPs of people on, on LinkedIn is no longer effective. Uh, I get roughly 100 to 200 DMs a day. It's really difficult to respond to people. Um, I do need to cut through that noise and also speak to customers. Customers love reaching out to me, remote customers, right? And sometimes there's also a people peer in the industry that really wants to chat through a difficult problem they have, and I, I miss that message. So I think it's about having a good growth marketing strategy around what you are providing and, and not simply just going with a, a traditional um, recruiting and outsourcing model. I, I don't think that's part of the future. I think it's about finding uh, ways of what is your segmented market? How are you going to grow that? How does that work? What is your outreach plan? Um, and, and working through that and, and not jump into the same noise filters where everyone else is living still. Love that. Some really great tips there. Mm -hmm. um, we have one of a uh, really popular question um, with the audience, which is also a very practical question that I really enjoy. What resources did you or do you still consult to make decisions regarding uh, capacity planning, people planning, human resources, um, especially on the podcast or books that you would recommend? Uh, wow, great question. I've read an amazing book very recently and it's on my desk because I'm still using it. Uh, it's called The Culture Playbook. I don't think this is going to give you the tools for hiring, to be honest, but great in terms of culture and belonging and how you map, I nearly want to say how you map all the people factors and the human factors of the world of work. It does touch us a little bit on um, hiring as well and, and what you do during that journey. Other tools, um, there's so many books. Um, I, I read uh, Redefining HR by Lars, Lars Schmidt from Amplify. Um, I was so impressed with his thinking around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the world of hiring, right? And in the world of um, accessibility. And um, what we're building here at Remote, for example, is to create the accessibility, not just for companies wanting to hire in all these countries, but for individuals to not be stuck in their 30 kilometer radius of mining companies, banks, traditional corporate companies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That is the accessibility that always excites me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's really about deciding like, what is that tool stack you need um, and what is no longer working? Following a, a corporate method in the world of modern people could also influence your culture. So making sure that you align more closely with what is the people first and, and modern modern people tech folks doing um, and rather follow those footsteps. Yeah. Great, great recommendations. Any podcasts on your list that you can recommend? I enjoyed this one. I enjoy you, Anthea. So it's been really nice listening to a few of yours this year. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so thanks for creating those. Um, wow. There's so many. I, I haven't listened to a recent one, but... Um, one of the ones that Brene Brown recently did 
um, it's on Spotify. It's not on the Apple. She has usually two, but it's on the Spotify one. It was very, very good with Adam Grant recently, where they were really talking about this quiet quitting term. And I loved mm-hmm. how they really called out what it's not. Burnout is not quiet quitting, right? And separating uh, those type of things. I really enjoyed that particular um, podcast recently, and there was a follow up from that. Highly recommended in the world of culture and people, and also thinking through the talent that you want to onboard in future. Mm. Love that. I think the the whole conversation around quiet um, quitting um, definitely lacks the you know the nuance around what it's not, um, and that idea that it's not burnout or it's not like you know overwork or you know emotional exhaustion or whatever the case may be. I think is really useful. Um, I we are fast running out of time. I have a few more questions, and I think I just want to zoom out a little bit. I touched on earlier on the macroeconomic factors right now. Um, I recently read the 2022 Kleiner Perkins People Report. Um, and in the report, uh, they said that the number one thing leaders can take note of during this time of uncertainty, um, you know, in terms of economic turmoil, et cetera, is that people are feeling that uncertainty. They are certainly feeling it and they're showing up with it in, their, in the workplace. In your view, how can people leaders think strategically during these times of uncertainty? I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I think I think everyone needs to realize you can still have a high performing team without working long hours. Um, and so I think that's the message I want to send. Like during sustainable periods, sometimes people go into all work mode and drop everything else. That's never going to work. If you burn a bunch of amazing, talented people out, you have no one and your product will fail. And so I think it's really important to recognize that you can have a high performing culture without burnout. You can create an environment, build efficiencies, start figuring out how to do something in 30 minutes versus three hours, um, and having having someone integrate their work into their life. When they have that opportunity um, to truly uh, not be uh, constantly only focused on work and having a life and that level of flexibility outside of work, I think they truly do stay engaged. Gotcha. I think the the challenging thing often is how you do the actual integration, especially, you know, when you are working remote and no one is showing up in an office and we can all have this shared experience. How do you help your team um, balance that? I guess the integrating, you know, the work into life. Um, I think it's about setting... um, writing really good guidelines about, you know, what boundaries to create and calling out that you need to learn how to stop working, having feedback discussions with folks that are continuously overworking, that are continuously on Slack on weekends. Mm -hmm. If they choose to work a Saturday and not work a Friday, gosh, that's absolutely up to them, right? That's part Mm -hmm. of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Um, But if they ping the whole company on a Saturday constantly and all their peers and colleagues, that can create noise where the colleague might feel they need to now be available on a Mm -hmm. Saturday. So really creating an environment where you guide people through what is the experience you're trying to create, what really works well in this environment, um, and have it, having it flexible enough that it's not rigid and people can con- contribute to that, asking for feedback very regularly. Uh, our current co-founders, Joven Marcelo, is doing a walk the floor soon. I'm so excited about it. It's where they literally just like, ask for feedback, like in a call and being available to chat about really difficult things. And sometimes things pop up there that just simply doesn't pop up in an engagement survey, right? You Mm. want it to pop up. You so badly Mm. want that feedback. Um, But I think it's a great opportunity to just cut through the noise and speak to uh, the CEO or the COO Mm. and address a problem um, or booking one-on-one time with them and talking Mm. through a difficult situation you're going through. Making space for that's really difficult um, if you have mm. 950 employees, but I think it's worth doing from time to time. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about the way you guide. You've got to be intentional. Documentation to me is still the number one requirement in a remote team. Um, and so you never want to create an environment where someone can't take any time off because mm. you're reliant on just them and their knowledge. It should be documented so anyone can Absolutely. do their job. Absolutely. Love that. We've recently um, adopted Slab within our own business and it's exactly to that point of how can we create these guidelines, share it visibly, make sure that we have these documentation from scorecards to, 
you know, uh, the missions that we're currently working on. And that knowledge repository is so useful and effective to enable remote work um, and async work. I have one more question from my side and I'll jump into the final audience questions. Remote is one of the only CVC scale-ups that has an exec team spread across over seven different countries, which is incredible. Um, on a practical level, how does your, how does a senior leadership team at Remote make this work? Um, and if you could give some practical examples, especially around showing up um, as humans online in these forums, that would be super useful. Um, it's so impressive to me. I've worked for so many companies in my life that had an executive team in one time zone. And even remote distributed companies, not remote.com, but others, um, <clears throat> often have an uh, exec team in San Francisco Bay Area, London, the Netherlands, like one key hub. I love that I get to work from South Africa as VP of people and being part of this exec team that actually is completely location agnostic and, and really doesn't care about that. So whoever we next hire, even if they're in New Zealand, which could be a very interesting time zone, compared to the rest of us, we will find a, a way to make it work. No matter how challenging, we will lean into that. This is this has probably been like prize winner worthy asynchronous work. 90% of our work is async. Up until this point, we've been meeting once a week, right? For, for me to be in an executive team where I only have one executive meeting once a week, I'm not talking about one-on-ones, right? Those still happen from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> those are very important and necessary but we meet up once a week for an hour to an hour and a half and really address crucial strategic things the rest of the time we solve all our problems asynchronously i love video content to unsol to to unblock something that's been very difficult with written communication. Remember, we're dealing with hundreds of different cultures, mm. hundreds of different versions mm. of English. I'm not English first language, right? And so if you think about that, how I'm describing something can be difficult if I'm writing it in a diff difficult way. And so sometimes turning that into a quick Loom video or Zoom recording or mm. voice note can really help someone understand what, you, what you're trying to say and unblock something. But it's been so impressive. Uh, we work like that 99% of the time. Um, the executive team also contributes to so many different discussions. And so we absolutely don't only work in this one siloed area. We still contribute to the rest of the organization's discussions. Sometimes we get pulled into something and sometimes we delegate and, and, and you know, distribute it to some, someone else that can actually solve it operationally better than us. And other times we might not show up in a conversation that we can clearly see it's already being unblocked without us, um, which is also amazing to see. So I think it is about, um, you know, having an async work culture um, and learning how to solve things without jumping on a call or without the need to constantly meet in the same room. Great. Yeah. Love that answer. We are also at the moment trying to reduce the number of hours we're spending in meetings. And we found Loom, uh, Slack videos, all of those super useful, just reduce the meeting time. Um, great answer. Thanks, Nadia. All right. Uh, we have time for probably two final questions. I'm going to take the first one uh, from Mansoor Na. And Mansoor is asking, how do you collaborate with other remote talent slash HR consultants? How, so how does wow. remote collaborate? Yeah, great question. I'm in a bunch of communities and I feel like this has contributed so much to my career where there's other fellow people peers at my level that we can talk about really important things um, that we're struggling with. So whether that is a total rewards program um, or going through a PTO type change or a policy. Um, I remember when I created Remote's anti-harassment policy, I intentionally made it publicly available. I wanted you know, amazing talent of the world to know before they apply to us what, what it means at remote and how important that is and sort of create a one global level of anti-harassment instead of segmenting it into 65 different policies, right? And so I clearly remember when I made that publicly available, how it was received in those communities and how easy it made their lives. And so giving back, sharing knowledge, sharing ideas um, <clears throat> has... Uh, has created uh, such a nice feeling of togetherness, even though I've never met half of these um, amazing people around the world. And there's many of those communities um, available for, for people teams. 
Love that. Well, Officen is a community-focused uh, pl developer jobs platform, so I think that's a perfect place to end it. Um, Nadia, thank you so, so much. Thank you for struggling through the cough. Really appreciate it. I'm really happy that you can rest your voice after this. Um, thank you to all the uh, audience participants uh, for all the questions. It's been really, really useful um, during the conversation. But that is a wrap. Um, we have covered a lot of ground this evening to understand the importance of the role of um, you know, just foresight, headcount planning, making sure that you are tying your values back to the um, interview process, being proactive, especially from a leadership perspective. And um, so really uh, thank you, Nadia, for all your expertise and insights. Um, we will be sharing some things after the event, so you can keep an eye out for uh, the video and a bunch of other um, event resources. Uh, but once the event concludes, there is an opportunity for you to provide feedback on tonight, so please do that. Um, and to join our community, your thoughts and comments are incredibly valuable. Um, Nadia, last uh, takeaway from your side, number one, 10 seconds or less, what's your one hack for surviving remote work? Take your PTO, take breaks, don't let it pile up, um, book time off, we all need it, it's been a big year and it's going to be another Love big, big one next year. Good. Love, so glad, agree so good to be here. Thanks for Thanks, sticking Nadia. with me through all the coffee. Not at all. Thanks everyone, we look forward to seeing you next year. Good night.